few hours after the bill seeking the establishment of a national agency for education and rehabilitation of repentant Boko Haram insurgents passed the first reading, mixed reactions have been expressed from various stakeholders. Among its supporters is the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, with Chibo community in Borono State and the Christian Association of Nigeria condemning it. And joining us still to discuss this this evening is legal practitioner Liboros Oshoma. Thank you for staying with us, Liboros. Okay. And also joining us is Leonard Ebute. Thank you, Leonard, for joining us, political analyst. Thank you. Now, let's, let's start off this way. First of all, please give me your opinion concerning this bill. Is, is this needed at this point? In our, co in our country history, given the myriads of security challenges and everything we're going through, is this what is needed? Liberos, let me take you. Uh, what happens here is that um, our government does not care about the rest of us. They really don't. Uh, they, some person just sit down somewhere and feel, you know, this is what we want to do, whether you like it or not, and they do it. Um, they, they, they are so insensitive to the plight of the ordinary man, uh, and that's why, you know, um, we we'll preach forgiveness in the face of. Um, of um, blood, you know, and death everywhere. Yet, um, the government hates its people so much that you can, you know, just imagine um, why somebody will sit down and conceive the idea of, uh, in the first place, even granting amnesty to militants and armed robbers, as if that is not bad enough. You now sit down and say, you know, there are some terrorists that, um, you know, rep they are repented we need to rehabilitate them. Meanwhile, you have a lot of people who have the capacity to carry guns who are not carrying guns and on the street. And what are you telling them? What signal are you telling them? Who are not rehabilitated? There are some and who are even educated, yeah. who are educated but are looking for government aid to move to the next level. And government is looking the other way. And then you look at people who are carrying arms against the state, you say you need to rehabilitate them and educate them. The message you're sending to the people who are law-abiding is that it pays to, to uh, be lawless. To, to be lawless. To, yes. And in a state of lawlessness, like Fidel Castro once said, it becomes illegal to be law-abiding. Leonard, your take, please. What, what's your two cents on this? I mean, it's... Um, what we want to achieve as a, as a nation, what we need to achieve as a nation right now is to put a stop to the bloodshed. But whether it is Boko Haram, the kidnapping, uncontrolled kidnapping and robbery and all that, but particularly Boko Haram where um, the logic of it is, is situated in a context that is both religious and cultural, right? And it's set up today, it's a war. It's, 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 it's a war between the Nigerian state and a group. And so like um, um, Barrister said, when you look at it, you ask yourself um, sh if the intention is to degrade this enemy and to save the Nigerian people and to grant a sense of justice to those that have been victims of this crisis, right? How does this fit into all that? It doesn't. It doesn't help you defeat them faster. It doesn't help you um, give a sense of reprieve to the victims. And it does nothing by way of emphasizing a sense of justice in the Nigerian. <coughs> and in the first place, I wanted to ask, is it even legal? What's the criteria for declaring someone repentant? Because he said so? If the person has been convicted or has been arrested for a crime and hasn't been prosecuted or have been prosecuted and is serving his tenure, is it the place of the state or the place of the military to unilaterally sit, declare the person repentant? What's the process for all that? And so when you look at the whole thing, you, you ask yourself, oh yeah, this is, this is not war, this is business. All right. Now we have joining us this evening by phone or former vice. Uh, Vice Marshal Femi Gradibo, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Vice Marshal. Good evening. Good evening. Now, I just want to have your take on this proposed education bill, Boko Haram education bill. What is your take on this? Well, um, it's a little bit disturbing because um, when people are radicalized, um, it, it takes quite a process to de-radicalize them. Uh, I 
want to believe that certain people are looking at the amnesty deal in the South South and trying to replicate it in their own part of the country. Um, there's no doubt that a lot of money has disappeared in the amnesty um, process. Uh, we are seeing evidence of it in even some of the issues that have been um, coming to bear in different parts of, even parts totally unrelated with amnesty, people who were involved legally and so on in handling the matters. And so, um, as long as Nigerians continue to think, okay, one part of benefited, well, we should also benefit, um, this kind of things will come up. But there should be a clear process in taking these decisions and looking at what we there. Because for me, there's a big difference between someone who blows up pipelines and someone who has perfected the art of slaughtering human beings like 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 chickens. Okay, if, if this bill, yes, two if, different mindsets to do that. If this bill okay. gets passed into law, um, I'm just wondering what what are the negative effects you think it could have on our security architecture? Um, because I, I just feel it's it's going to be sending some wrong messages. What, what do you feel about that? Well, it, it will. So it's about also educating those who are trying to propose these bills. Our immediate pro uh, priority should be to uh, remove as many of Boko Haram's uh, deep, you know, soldiers off the streets. So once you can capture them, uh, you put them somewhere, and then you try your process of radicalization. But then you would need a strong team, um, the medical experts, there are other issues. And when you talk about the soldiers who are still fighting, when you talk about the families that have lost loved ones, people who have lost properties, then you, you, there's also need for some form of truth and, you know, truth and reconciliation to take place. Uh, before and I let you go, yes. How are you going to use them, you must figure out a non-aggressive means of using them. So they must be kept totally away from the military. Uh, we have, a, you know, farm settlements could be a fantastic idea, you know. All right, um, before I let you go this evening, now, I, I believe everybody deserves a second chance, but in your opinion and view, do, do you think these ex-terrorists, if we're to call them that, deserve a second chance at freedom? Well, there's no doubt that everyone deserves a second chance. But the point we must be careful about, um, like I said, with, the, uh, with someone who's been radicalized, is that some of them can actually be turned into sleepers in the sense that they can go back into society and at the appropriate time, it could be a catchphrase on TV, on radio, and they can be activated again. And at that time, they would have been so well dispersed within the populace that it would be difficult to contain the mayhem. If you notice the kind of at war that was going on now, it's, it's hit and run. It's not like really one-on-one -on -one confrontation with the Nigerian army. And so they use their informants, they figure out where the soldiers are non-existent and go there and commit havoc and disappear. So it would be really sad if you let these people lose on the populace in the sense that they got radicalized over just a few months. And then uh, I, I understand some people are suggesting putting them in the army. Yeah. All right. Mr. It's, Femi Badebo, former Air Vice Marshal, thank you very much for joining us and for your contribution. You're welcome. Now, Leonard, I, let me just throw back to you. Do you think they deserve a second chance at freedom? What does that even mean? There is crime, then there is retribution. We don't, we're not party to the decision to do the crime. The law sets out what retribution is commensurate to the crime. What does that say to the rest of us that are not carrying guns, but maybe the guy just cheated in WAEC and couldn't get into the university? 
or the young guy that is arrested on the streets of Lagos called a Yahoo boy and he has to go do his time. Does he deserve a second chance or not? We all need a second chance at rehabilitation and prison in real terms is for rehabilitation. So my grouse really is, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but the penalty for um, terrorism is 20 years to death sentence, right? The entire Boko Haram hiatus isn't even up to 20 years yet. So it is not even up to the minimum retribution required for the gravity of crimes they are committing. And then we're talking about um, um, a second chance. A second chance at what? A second chance to look in the eyes of the mothers and fathers of the victims. A second chance for Nigeria again to worry about recapturing the same people they had captured before. You have not even degraded this enemy sufficiently. They are not in a position to come to an arbitration yet, like the, the, the Eva Marshall was talking about. This war has to end, and the enemies have to be in a position where they want to talk. You are talking about an enemy that is growing <laughs> in leaps and bounds every single day, and you want to release soldiers back to him on some, 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 some really crazy, in my view, um, 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 thought process that isn't seated in any tested philosophy of human rehabilitation anywhere in the world. Nobody, no country in the world has successfully executed a program of de-radicalization. And this is, we are, we are the least prepared for it because nobody has even done any study on the philosophy of radicalization in Nigeria with Boko Haram as a case study. So what's the basis for this? There's no academic basis for it. There's no philosophical basis for it. But beyond that, when you take away that sense of justice that the victims need to have, you have created another enemy. I cannot look in the face of the guy that killed my daughter three years ago and murdered everybody in my village and still pay allegiance to the state that set him free. I can't do that. It insults my personal sense of justice. And when legal justice fails, jungle justice will prevail because justice will always be served. Now, we are right, now Mr. Liberos, if this, just in case this bill gets passed into law, what do you think will be some of its negative effects to our entire architecture, security architecture as, as a nation? Um, do you know why, like the AVM said, do you know why um, there's a prevalent of Boko Haram um, and kidnapping will never end anywhere because we compensate criminality? Mm -hmm. When government mooted the idea of even granting amnesty, I had a matter I was handling, um, somebody who, who kidnapped, you know, um, one of my clients, um, mother in the village, you know, was a dead devil arm robber, then operating between Port Harcourt and Oweri. He was arrested, and when he was about to, charge, to be charged to court, he said he's been granted amnesty and the state can no longer do anything. And you know how painful it was to the victims. And, um, and, and so, your question, the effects are much more than negative. And that's why Boko Haram today is striving. You remember there was a time even a very senior lawyer, Michael Zekome, mooted the idea of amnesty for kidnappers. Very soon we'll grant amnesty to arm robbers, headsmen, you know, murderers. And then they will arrest, you know, like Leonard said, exam cheaters, Yahoo boys. The message you are sending, the impact on the society is that you know, the society can no longer take care of the good ones. You know, you have to be bad so this government can recognize you. And then so we created this, um, this uh, we brought this thing upon ourselves. So the only way we can compensate for it is to share some of these goodies with them a little bit. Do you know the pain you feel when, as a father, you, you know that your taxes are being used to rehabilitate the people that killed your, 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 your words? Mm -hmm. Do you know the pain you feel as a mother in the barrack who's, who had to wait endlessly, was not even told that the husband had died in the war front, and then only for the troops to come back, your husband is nowhere to be found, and then they say, 
well, we're sorry. And then you hear that the people that killed your husband are being rehabilitated with salaries that your husband ought to have earned. Do you know the pain that the society would feel when people who take up arms against the state and who have caused mayhem render people homeless mm. are the same people that the state is busy chasing mm. around to rehabilitate? Mm. You know, that, that's how painful it can be. You have IDP camps everywhere. Look, we have, we have renamed our prisons to correctional centers. So you leave them in prison and correct them there. And lastly, somebody who has been radicalized for 16 years, 17 years, you can't de-radicalize that person in one month. All right. It's not Legal practitioner, Liberus or Schumann, thank you for joining us on the show and for your contributions and also to you, political analyst, Leonard Ebute. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take our plus report now, and when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Stay with us. The Nigerian Senate has expressed worry as current national plans have been unable to improve the lives of millions of Nigerians across the country. The Senate, while deliberating on a motion moved by Senator Odua, which called for the establishment of a visionary budget-driven national framework, said current development indices are nothing to write home about. Senator Odua said that despite Nigeria's articulated national plans over the last few years, the nation has still not gotten its budgeting process right. With the 47.7 of the population and a figure of 94,734,000 million, as at November 2020, one third of the nation's children are never enrolled in school. And so Nigeria currently has the highest rate of HIV and AIDS related deaths in the world. We are convinced that there is an urgent need to identify and eliminate the obstacles that have posed the problem to successful conceptualization and implementation of previous national development plan in Nigeria ahead of the next generation of national plan. How best way we can come out of this door drum and make a good plan that will work for all of us? in conjunction with the Ministry of National Plan. I quite agree with that. But also, we should look inward and look into how do we even harness these resources that is available before us? How do we block all the leakages? How do we try to show up our revenues? Over-reliance and depending on one source of revenue has not helped us as a nation. We all know about long-term planning. And we, know, we all know that there should be linkages between budgeting and um, economic growth or socio-economic growth. We understand that. But why have we not been able to achieve that in Nigeria? That is the real question. And I think that was what the chief whip was touching on. And I think this motion goes to the heart of that problem, especially in the prayers. And so I think it is the work of this Senate to investigate and come up with solutions to making sure that we continue to link planning, particularly long-term planning, to medium-term planning, to budgeting, which eventually ends up in economic growth. We are directionless when it comes to planning, national planning and budget. Nigeria is signatory to so very many international treaties and conventions in the area of health, where we say universal health coverage, 15% of our annual budget should go to health. We are not honoring it. Even the act of the National Assembly over our own health act, we are not honoring it. So in which case, the planning that we have nationally in the direction of health, we are not respecting the goal. It's a whole lot you know, different from what came in the subsequent year, and then of course what came up in 2020. So Mr. President, I want to say that the solution to all of this you know, yes, you have suggested there is nowhere in the world where money is placed alongside with development that there is no planning. The problem which is posited here. And here is my take. Sometimes I do wonder, do our leaders know we are a nation? Do they really understand the phrase peace and unity used in our national anthem? Because if they do, the Army Chief of Staff would not have taken actions he did. 
I mean, yes, we're human and we're allowed to have our biases, but not at the expense of the security of our nation. The Boko Haram education bill is not totally wrong, in my opinion. It's just coming at the wrong time. There is nothing wrong with waiting, wanting to rehabilitate the ex-terrorists, but not now. Not when 30 people were killed barely two weeks ago in Aono village in Bruno State, and definitely not when there are still rumors that the terrorists are getting support from foreign countries like Turkey. Nothing has been heard from about Leah Sharibu and the other Chippewa girls that have not been released. Their leaders, history does not repeat itself. In 2010, you gave amnesty to Niger Delta militants, and barely five years later, attacks killing hundreds were carried out by these terrorists. You are only encouraging future troublemakers. And this is not the right time for this bill. And that's all for tonight. Thank you for staying with us on Plus Politics. And it will return next week Monday, same time. Until then, be well.